I will be forever the myth. You're the king of kings, <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken for the week. All right, welcome to the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. I have a very special guest with me this week, Mr. John Taylor, who won the Teenage Mr. USA contest back in 1980. So we're going to talk some old school bodybuilding. John, how are you doing? I'm doing great, John. Yourself? Great, great. Thank you. Well, John, let's start from uh, the very beginning, like how you got into bodybuilding. What, what got you into weight training and then decided to uh, compete in bodybuilding? Sure. So um, I, I, I grew up in Pennsylvania and... I was a wrestler. Okay. Uh, rest, I started wrestling at an early age, and by about the time I was 13 or 14 years old, I started to see some advantages to the wrestling through uh, performing weight training. Okay. And um, at about, about that time, there was um, a former Mr. America who had opened a gym that was in the town next to ours, uh, John DeCola, who had won the 1969 yeah. IFBB Mr. America. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah. So he opened up. Uh, it was called the Apollo Diana Health Spa. Okay. And um, so I, I kind of segued from uh, doing what I would read in the magazines, which I was you know, grossly overtraining, still trying to lift weights during wrestling season. Okay. Um, and so I, I, I met John, and I was pretty much hooked on bodybuilding from the time that I, that I met John. Uh, how, John how old were you there, John? About, I'm sorry. How old were you then? Uh, I was 14 years old when I met John. Okay. And so, um, and that was back when gyms were split. They were not co-ed at that point. And we had, men had Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and I believe Sunday mornings. Ladies <laughs> came in at the, the other days. Wow. So, um, you know, I would either get a ride over to, to the gym because it was, you know, it was before I had a driver's license, um, either through friends or sometimes my, my mom would, would uh, take me over. Okay. And, um, and, and John was, he was uh, an outstanding um, individual to represent the sport and he was a great mentor a great coach uh, he really kind of took me under his wing and for about five years I, I trained under under John I worked out with him occasionally wow. um, and he was you know when going from ne never meeting a bodybuilder to being first introduced to someone like John DeCola uh, I don't know if you you've seen pictures of John back when yeah. he competed but and he had a very long competition history but he had arms, they were like balloons. I mean, he had a great overall physique, but I just yeah. remember my mouth dropping open the first time I saw him. Wow. And John actually, uh, you know, he was always a proponent of natural bodybuilding. Yeah, uh, he, I heard you know, that. He, was he a natural bodybuilder? So, yeah, yeah. So th throughout his career, he, you know, he had remained a, a natural bodybuilder. In fact, that's why he, he left the sport. Uh, in the uh, really after he competed in the 1969 Mr. America, yeah, he, he felt that to progress to that next level would require the use of drugs, and it's just that was just a risk he wasn't willing to take. Wow, yeah, and, he had an outstanding physique for being natural. Oh yeah, what you mean? I, I, absolutely, uh, symmetry, uh, posing. Um, he did compete uh, several times after that, uh, of course, on a, you know, a natural path, mm. but um, he, was, he was always a big Vince Gironda advocate, yeah. and a lot of the exercises that he, you know, he had us doing were right out of the, the Vince Gironda playbook. Okay. Um, in fact, I never even did a squat until I was probably 19 years old. Wow. Um, I always did sissy squats, and they called them uh, bump squats and leg extensions and, and thing of that nature, but you know, I was... I was young, so my body responded pretty much to anything that I mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I spent five years you know, working out under uh, John DeCola. I competed in a number of the, the local Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware type competitions. Okay. Um, and I guess the first big competition that I competed in was the Teenage Mr. Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And that was back in 1980. And I won my class. Um, I, I lost the overall title to uh, a guy by the name of Danny Morrow. Yeah. And, and yeah, Danny Morrow was, he was, he was an outstanding bodybuilder, uh, just, just loads and loads of potential. Okay. Uh, you talk about symmetry. He, he had it all. Yeah. And 
Um, so later that year in 1980, I also uh, I competed against Danny again at the Teenage Mr. USA. But what I had done is I, I went up to, to Long Island and I trained at Steve Mihalik's Mr. America Body Shop. Oh, okay. And so I spent uh, the last three or four months training up there prior to the Teenage Mr. USA competition. And it really, it was quite an eye-opening experience for me. Mm -hmm. um, we... We trained under the, the program, if you've heard of Intensity or Insanity. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I think I'm still recovering from that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, 40 years later. Um, but uh, John, were you in the, um, I'm looking at your contest history here, were you in the 77 uh, Teenage Mr. America? Yes. Okay. Yes, I was. Yeah. And, and the reason that I went in that primarily was because it was being held in, in Boston. Okay. And that was John DeCola's, well, he was from uh, 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 Framingham, Massachusetts. Right. But um, a suburb of Boston. So, you know, I decided I would go up. He kind of encouraged me to compete in that. And it, it was just, you know, I did it for the experience. It was, it was really good. I believe James Yazenshock, if I yeah. recall correctly, was the winner that year. Right. So how, how did you feel going in? Was that your first teenage show? No, that was not my first teenage show. My first teenage show was... Actually, when I was 15 years old, wow. I entered a uh, competition called the Teenage Mr. Potomac Valley. It was an okay. AAU competition. It was in Washington, D.C. I had no idea what to expect. <laughs> um, I won the competition, surprisingly. Really? Wow. Yeah, well, I, the, the, the guy in second place was wearing gym shorts to give you <laughs> <any> kind of <laughs> indication of, of the level. But, right. um, but nonetheless, it was, it was very exciting for me to, to actually bring home some hardware from, from my first competition. How did, and, and how did again, you look then, John, at, at 15? How did you look? You know, it, um, I, I had, I, I'd like to say that I had good genetics for bodybuilding. Yeah. Um, I, I had um, natural legs. My upper body was probably lagging behind my legs a little bit, but, mm -hmm. but still fairly well balanced. Um, because I had been a wrestler, I was pretty lean okay. um, and, and, and fairly muscular. I'd say for my age, Muscular, yeah. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, John DeCola was helping you back then, right? Well, yes, think, yes, he was. Okay. Yeah. Did he go with you to that show? No, he didn't. He didn't accompany me to the show, but he was, he was, uh, you know, called me right away afterwards. He was very interested. He helped me put together my posing routine. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, what was the contest like back then? Because tell, tell our listeners, like, what the contest, this is 77. So, that was the year Pumping Iron came out. So, what, how was the show staged and what was that like? Okay, so in 1977, that would have been the Teenage Mr. America up in Boston. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So you, or, or you want to go back to the first competition? Yeah, when was the first one? Was that 70, like five? Oh, yeah. So the, the Teenage Mr. Potomac Valley, that was, it was, I recall it was held in a, a high school gymnasium. Mm -hmm. they, they had the, the black curtain drawn behind the, the makeshift stage. Okay. The, the, the overhead light was adjusted. I don't even think we had music back then. No, I don't think so either. <laughs> and it was held in conjunction with a weightlifting event. Really? Okay. As, as, most, as most were back then. Yeah. yeah and that's, that's then I ventured into crazy. some of the competitions. Um, if you know the name Bill Stevens, if you've ever come across that, he, he used to sponsor competitions down in outside of Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. And they were some, some local shows. I think we even had maybe the Mr. East Coast or something like that. But okay. um, we would, you know, we would hit some of those competitions and they were, they were always a lot of fun and inspiring. You got to meet people. Yeah. So how many shows were you doing then? You started at 15 and like, how often did you compete? I would compete in about two or three competitions a year and, and during the summertime. Uh, during okay. the, the fall and winter, I was, and spring really, I was focused on wrestling. Okay. So you were so, still doing wrestling with the bodybuilding? I was, yeah. I wrestled uh, up through through high school. Um, oh, wow. It was kind of a difficult decision for me whether to wrestle in college or not. I opted to to focus on bodybuilding. Oh, really? Okay, okay. Yeah. So how did that work? Because I know wrestling, they wanted you to keep your weight down, and I'm sure you were trying to get bigger with bodybuilding, right? Well, <laughs> I was I was a stubborn stubborn individual as a teenager, and um, the first couple of years in wrestling, when I got into high school wrestling, I was cutting weight trying to make make weight mm -hmm. and my senior year I decided you know I, I don't want to lose size I'm going to wrestle at uh, 185 pounds I was really a legitimate 167 pounder probably without even trying so wow. you know I just I was bitten by the iron bug I didn't want to to sacrifice any of the harder muscle so right. I was I was consuming a lot of calories while all the other guys were cutting weight for the weight 
that. Right. Um, I was I was trying to increase my calories, and I was tipping the scale at about 180 pounds when <laughs> I could have been as heavy as 185 to wrestle. So I, I, I'm sure I could have done much better in wrestling uh, mm -hmm. had I wrestled at a weight that would have allowed me to be the most competitive I could have been. Yeah, yeah, I could see that because I'm sure every year you probably got bigger and bigger. I did. I did. As a, as a freshman, I was about 120 pounds. Wow. So each year I was, I was increasing weight. Yeah. Um, and, and that was, a lot of that was from um, John's nutritional advice. Mm -hmm. He was very, very uh, big into eating healthy foods and, you know, a typical bodybuilder's diet, uh, right. kind of higher on the protein, but, uh, but pretty, pretty well balanced. Right. Okay. So what other shows did you do then as a teenager? You did that Teenage Mr. Potomac Valley at 15 and then any other, uh, any other ones before you got to like 77? So I can recall uh, titles such as Teenage Mr. Apollo, okay. uh, Teenage Mr. Cumberland Valley. Um, I believe there was a Teenage Mr. East Coast. And, and, and I wasn't winning all of those. I won some. Yeah. Uh, Teenage Mr. Del Marva, I believe, was, was one of the titles. But, um, yeah. but those led up to preparation for the Teenage Mr. Pennsylvania, where I was, you know, I was competitive in that. And when I went into the Teenage Mr. America in Boston, it was really something that I went into just for the experience. Yeah. I, I knew that I wouldn't fare real well. In fact, it's, it's kind of a funny, funny story. Um, I listened to your podcast and by the way, oh, I really, really enjoy okay. what you do. I appreciate that. Um, in that, in the, the height division that I was in at the 1977 Team America, uh, John Defendus competed and he was, um, he was also in that same height class, and I believe right. he placed one spot ahead of me. Okay. And um, in one of, and when you were interviewing him in, in one of the podcasts, he made the comment that about that teenage Mister America show, and he said, "You know, I, I, I believe I beat some people who were swimmers." <laughs> and so I, I was one of the swimmers that he. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> So, yeah, and, and, you know, it's, it's one thing I will say, and, and John, I think that it's, it might be lost in today's gym environment or bodybuilding is when we trained at John DeCola's gym, we, we, it was just, there was so much camaraderie. We just had yeah. so much fun. I mean, there were times when we really couldn't even finish a set because we were laughing so hard and just yeah. got to yeah. practical jokes on each other. It was, it was a great environment. Yeah, it was. I, I started training in late 70s, too. So I remember like the gyms I was going to like around 1980, 1981. Yeah. They were just, they were, I don't think people today understand it. They were like little gyms, you know, they were just independently owned smaller gyms. Right. Um, not a ton of equipment like you see today. I mean, I, I imagine the kids that grew up in today's world, they can never even imagine it because the gyms today are just so big, all that cardio equipment and all that stuff. And all of them, uh, they have all these, uh, TVs now. I mean, we didn't have any of that stuff back then. You know, we just had this hardcore training. Yeah, but you're right. It was smaller and you had a great camaraderie. I remember going to the gym and there was, I, I knew so many guys in the gym and we'd all like help each other, encourage each other. Yeah, absolutely. And even, oh, even competitors back in that, in that day, you know, you'd, you would really, you know, you, you, of course you would be training against yourself. You want to be as at your best. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, you, you supported those you competed with and they yeah. became friends. Yeah. Yeah, I remember um, the gym I went to, I think I've told this story on the air before, they had a uh, big mirror, um, and it was in the room that faced, like, the outside, you know, the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they had a plate glass window, and so the, one, the light would come in, and so you'd have really good lighting in that room, you know. So everybody would go in front of that mirror to pose. So yeah. I remember, like, if, uh, a guy, if a guy was getting ready for a show, it was like a week out, and he would go over – and he would take his shirt off and pose, the whole gym would come over and watch. You know, you'd have like 30 people yeah. standing behind him and they wouldn't say anything. Everybody was just standing watching and it was like a show of respect, I guess. Like, you know, yeah. this guy's getting ready and they would just watch him. And then after he got done, people would say, oh, you look great or whatever. But that was, I mean, can you imagine that today? I could, like, these no, gyms today, if no, you took I your really... shirt off, they'd kick you out, you know? I mean, in my opinion, and maybe, you know, maybe I'm biased because that's the era we grew up in. It just, yeah. it seems like there's something important that's been lost. Yeah, yeah. It was just uh, that camaraderie was there. And then if somebody competed, like, I remember like 30 guys from the gym would all go to the contest to watch this guy and cheer him on. And then after we all go out for pizza. It was just, yeah. it was great. You know, yeah. it's not, that doesn't exist today. Yeah, right, right. What are the other, uh, do you remember any other guys in that Teenage America that you did in 77? Because I was looking, there were some pretty big names in there. 
Oh, uh, as, as, I, as I mentioned, Jane Jazz and Chuck, what was the overall winner? Yeah. Um, I, there were, there were I, I, off the top of my head, no. I, I can't remember uh, too many of the other competitors. I mean, I'm sure if I looked at a list, I, they would, you know, yeah. the, the, the physiques would come right back to me. Um, but I can tell you that, you know, as, as few years passed, and from the teenage Mr. Uh, Pennsylvania and then the teenage Mr. USA, those were competitive competitions. Oh, yeah, for uh, sure. And in, in the teenage Mr. USA, uh, you know, there was, of course, Jeff King was, uh, he won the, the tall class. Yeah. And or maybe they were weight classes back then. I think they were by, by 1980. I think you went to okay. weight classes, yeah. Yeah. There was um, uh, Jean Paul Guillaume, yeah. I'm yeah. not pronouncing that correctly. Right. Uh, Danny Morrow competed in that competition. And, of course, there, there were others as well. But at the same time, um, we, we all supported each other. Uh, yeah. I can remember, I can remember after I won the teenage Mr. Uh, USA, after I was announced the winner, the first thing was, you know, Jeff King and Danny Morrow congratulated me. Wow. And, um, yeah, it was, uh, and if, if I didn't win, I would have loved to have seen one of them win. But, but of course they both had their, uh, phenomenal successes later on, uh, particularly, yeah. particularly Jeff. How did you how did you think about Jeff? What did you think about Jeff at that time? Because he was a teenager, but he was huge, right? From the pictures I seen, he looked huge. He was. He was he was probably the individual that I was most concerned about going into that competition. Yeah. I never uh, met him in person. Uh, uh, of course, you know, through the magazines and through Bob Gruskin, I yeah. knew quite a bit about Jeff. Um, Jeff was had potential written all over him. Yeah. Uh, you could you could see that in the competitions. He just at that point probably hadn't mastered the art of um, peaking for a competition. Right. That's right. probably all it was because he, he could have easily walked away with the title had his timing been a little bit uh, yeah. on. So you mentioned Bob Gruskin. When did you meet him, John? I met Bob Gruskin early on. I met him when I was uh, 15 at one of my first competitions. Okay. And he had, um, he had taken a picture of me and did a little story. There was a newsletter uh, I think it was called the East Coast Bodybuilder. So okay. Like something of that nature. But um, I mean, we stayed in touch. He would, um, he would take pictures. Um, sometimes I would get them in a few months. Sometimes I'd ask him a year later. For the right. but, but anyways, he was, he was a very good guy. He was very supportive uh, about the sport. Yeah. Um, he would, uh, you know, and I would see him. He would usually come to, to competitions, uh, usually with somebody that he had coached for, for the various competitions. Right. Did he, what did he say about you when, uh, when he met you? Did he say you had potential or? Yeah, he, he thought that I, he thought that I had very good potential. He, he once wrote, um, he once wrote that he, he thought that I had legs that could pretty much stand up to Tom Platt's, which wow. is you know, he's a little <laughs> bit of an embellishment there, but, um, but nonetheless, he was, yeah, he was, he was one of my uh, biggest supporters and advocates. And, it, and of course, as a teenager, you're very impressionable. And it just, it felt great to have somebody like that in the sport who was backing you and, yeah. and wanted to see you succeed. And he would right. give me, you know, some helpful hints and pointers, but I really, it was really John DeCola who I looked up to. Um, okay. You know, it's the thing that I did not do was, was follow John's advice to, to remain drug free through, mm -hmm. through competitions. Yeah. Um, but you know, back then we used, I, I guess it's, it, it really was probably child's play, play compared to what people yeah. do these days. I don't even really know exactly everything they do these days. But um, uh, but I did go down that road, and and eventually the ironic thing is that's probably what pulled me away from the sport and, and had oh, me really? stop competing. Yeah, I just I, I I had reached a point where I felt that um, you know I needed I needed to focus on a career. Um, I was becoming kind of disenchanted with some of the politics that I was seeing in the sport. Okay, um, and so um, uh, I I ended up I. Get, got a master's, well, I ended up with an undergraduate degree in business management from the University of Maryland and then a master's degree in exercise science from George Mason University. Okay. And I, um, I went into uh, an internship program with the Department of the Army um, in, in acquisitions, buy, okay. buying things for the Army. And after about five years with them, I was hired by the National Institutes of Health to, to do the same job. And I spent my career with NIH, uh, in specific, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And I, hmm. I retired as uh, their director of the Office of Acquisitions no after kidding. 33 years. And wow. um, 
it was, it was, it was, you know, I was, I was fortunate to have the job that I did and, and work yeah. with the people that I did. I, uh, the day before I retired, um, the office of the director at NIH asked me if I would um, stay on as a contractor. And so that's what I'm doing now. That was two years ago. And I, I still work two, two and a half days a week, um, supporting the office of acquisitions at the, the highest level of, at NIH. Wow. And my wife, Adrian has about another year, year and a couple of months until she retires. Mm. So, you know, once she retires, then we'll kind of enter that next chapter of our life. But yeah. right now it's, it's a nice transition for me from, uh, from working full time into, and of course now with everybody working from home, it's, it's a yeah. different, different story. What is NIH again, John? National yeah. Institute of Health? Um, um, excuse me? What, what was NIH again? The, company the, the Nas National Institutes of Health. Of Health. It's, okay. uh, it's the largest biomedical research um, institution in, in the world, really. Mm -hmm. they, they fund a lot of uh, research and development on all types of uh, diseases, the prevention, treatment of diseases. Oh, okay. um, they have a number of different institutes that, that focus on sp specific diseases. As I mentioned, I was with the, the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Wow, that's great. That's great. Yeah. You so, may have heard of the Framingham Heart Study. Yeah, um, a lot of a lot of research findings come out of that. That that's that's a, a program that's been going on probably for over sixty years now, and they're they're wow. my guess is they're probably onto their fourth generation of the cohort that was originally recruited for that study. But that's a that's a, a very very large study. A lot of important research data has come out, out of that, and that was funded by the National Heart Lung, Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. Wow. Okay. So you knew when you got out of when you decided to walk away from bodybuilding, you stayed with health and exercise because you got your I did. exercise science. Yeah. 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 I really, um, I, I shifted my focus from, um, from, from bodybuilding to more what I considered to be health. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, in fact, one of my friends at the, the, the heart and blood Institute was really getting into running and he wanted me to start running with him. I, I'll, I'll say I, I've never stopped resistance training. I, I, I've always kept that up. I, yeah. you know, I just scaled back on the amount that I would do, but, um, but we started running and it, it started out as, you know, trying to do a, a 5k run at lunchtime to where we were running marathons together. Wow. And, okay. and I ended up uh, completing eight, eight marathons. And my, my, my running career ended one evening when, um, our two dogs started acting up and I got over, um, got up about, I f I'd fallen asleep on the couch. And um, so it was dark. I got up to kind of separate them and I tripped over them. Mm. And I, la I landed on the hardwood floor and both of my knees, um, the uh, patellar tendons were severed. Oh my God. Uh, it was, wow. uh, yeah, it was a, a freaky accident. And yeah. um, my wife called me and she said, you know, John, are you coming to bed? And I said, uh, I don't know. And, um, and she thought I was just clowning around. So I didn't see her until about six o'clock in the morning. Oh, no. And uh, I had tried to, to stand up and I pulled myself over to the couch. And when I did get myself in an upright position and let go, I went straight down because there was, mm. there was nothing connecting the, the quads to the lower. Yeah. You know. So you had to get both of those repaired. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that took quite a bit of physical therapy to, to recover from. And, and I never, I never went back to, to really to, to running for anything other than maybe to, for some, you know, interval training. But, yeah. but I, to this day, I still enjoy doing some, you know, some cardio and some resistance training. Yeah. Just, I think once it's in your blood, you just. Yeah. Bitten by the iron bug. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. John, what do you think about um, today? I don't know how much you follow the sport of bodybuilding today. And I don't want to rip on these guys today, but um, Obviously, the drug usage has increased tremendously over the last 40 years since you last competed. So yeah. what do you think about that uh, in comparison to the way it used to be? Um, you know, I wouldn't want to take anything away from the effort that mm -hmm. these guys put in and their dedication and, and their passion for the sport. But it's just it's an appearance that um, I don't favor. Yeah, um, I would say if today's bodybuilding was in vogue at the time I started, I probably wouldn't have done bodybuilding. Yeah, I hear that. Um, I hear that a few from a few different people. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I really liked the classic physique, mm -hmm. and um, uh, so it's just uh, you know the times have changed, but it's just it's just not for me. And I started to see a shift also, probably anywhere from the early to mid '80s is where I kind of started to see what they call mass monsters coming yeah. into play. Yeah. And that was just never, 
never appealed to me. Right, right. And then it just went on from there and they just got bigger, yeah. and, bigger and bigger. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, when, when you decided to do the drugs as a teenager, I mean, you probably pretty much had to, right, to be competitive. I mean, at that state, I mean, even though the guys weren't using a lot at, at the national level, they were still using, right? Yeah, it was, it was, it was widespread at that time. Um, yeah. I, I don't know that, you know, everybody was, I, I remember Jean-Paul Guillaume, you know, was, was natural. Yeah. Um, there were probably a few others, but uh, for the most part to compete at uh, the national level, basically yeah. everybody was doing it. And, um, and of course, when I went to Steve, Steve Mihalik's gym, you, you know, the reputation of yeah. Uh, yeah, right, right. That, that place. So that was an eye opening experience for me. So mm-hmm. um, it, not only was the training different than anything I had ever undertaken, he also had me on a um, 500 to a thousand calorie diet a day. Jeez. And it was, I, I, I thought the guy was, I thought he was trying to see whether I'd, I'd, I'd be around by the time the show came. <laughs> right. But, um, you know, I gave it my all. I, I trained with a guy there named, by the name of Don Modulewski. Do you know that name? Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember Don Modulewski. Yeah. yeah, and he was, this guy was a, um, a genetic freak and, and extremely strong. I was never a real strong bodybuilder. I had good, good endurance, good muscular endurance, but, but, you know, my overall strength level was nothing compared to his. His... My yeah. max was his warm up, but we trained great together. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, he was older than you then, right, John? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don was probably he had to have been at least ten to fifteen years older than me. Yeah, I remember he was competing in those IFBB shows in the seventies. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was that was an atmosphere that uh, in that gym in Steve Mahalik's gym that uh, I think was fairly rare. It was it was so competitive and people would push and drive and yeah um, and Steve Mahalik was he was so he was a very articulate guy mm-hmm. and he could he could fire fire you up for the sport and I mean he he was I mean I know there's a lot of stories about Steve um, I, I always had a good relationship with Steve he had me over to his house um, wow. and, and, and certainly I saw some times where you know the the not so good side of Steve came to yeah. light but, but for the most part, I, I, I had very good relations with him. So did he actually train you, John? Was he pushing you and training you? Yeah, yeah. yeah and I, I worked out with him a couple of times. But it was primarily uh, Don Modulewski that I worked out with. But okay. Steve would, uh, he would critique my, my, my posing. He would critique, you know, go over the diet with me constantly. Um, uh, yeah, he was, he, was a, he was a big supporter. Mm-hmm. So tell me like about one of his workouts, like, uh, like what kind of stuff did he have you do? Well, <laughs> I'll give you an example. One time we, we were working legs and Steve, Steve worked legs with us and he set up about, I don't know, about seven or eight stations okay. and nobody else in the gym was allowed to, to go <laughs> close to those. Right. And we would start out, we would start out with like 10 sets of leg extensions and not easy sets. Yeah. I mean, these were all, pretty much pushed to the max. Right. And then after you did the leg uh, extensions, you were considered to be warmed up for the real activity. <laughs> and, and I gotta, I gotta tell you, John, there was, I can remember during that, that one evening when we were working out with Steve and this was, a, I was probably two months out from the competition and my calories were really low. And, um, and I was literally falling down on the floor <laughs> when we were going through this workout routine and, and, and about the third or fourth time I fell down, I got up. I remember it was like um, a revelation. I said, you know something? This is like overtime in a wrestling match, and yeah. you can't beat me. It was kind of a turning point for me. I realized yeah. whatever they're going to dish out, you know, I'm going to be around. I'm going I'm to do whatever it takes. I'm going to follow their lead. But um, it, was, it was not a, the type of training that I would um, advocate for anyone for long term. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that there are still those, there are some people who really believe in it. Maybe their bodies are, you know, uh, are such that they can withstand that type of training. Yeah. I couldn't, I, I, you know, to this day, one of my favorite author, authors is Clarence Bass. Yeah. I don't know if you, if you've sure. read his materials, but, uh, you know, the, the, the less is more just, just makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah. I don't know to that degree. But I really think that um, uh, doing less and focusing on strength training, which was something I never really did when I was younger, and I, I kind of regret that. I wish that I had tried the, the power lifts and developed oh, right. some of the core strength, but um, yeah, that was what it was. Yeah. 
Yeah, Clarence Bass was always really concerned with his health. You know, he always had his body fat levels low, but it seemed like even back then he was talking about his blood pressure, his cholesterol, you know, his yeah. diet was extremely clean. I remember that, you know. Now, when you did that uh, leg workout, what other stations did he have? You started with the oh, leg Oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I right. skewed away from that. So uh, he had us, we were doing like, I guess they'd call it giant sets. You'd go yeah. from from regular squats to a leg press to lunges to front squats. And there may have been something else that we were doing, but it was, and the, and the weights were ridiculous. I mean, I, <laughs> I would, uh, I, you know, they would help me up with it, but you know, if I, if, and, and I was in, in squats, you know, I, could, I mentioned to you, I didn't start squatting really until I had gotten to Mahalik's gym, but wow. I was able to do um, 20 to 25 reps with 315 in wow. full squats with my, my feet under um, two by fours, my heels yeah. under two by fours. So I had the endurance. I couldn't go up a whole lot more in weight for a single rep, but we would start out, I mean, with three plates on the bar and it would just go downhill for the <laughs> for me. Right, right. Yeah. I lost when I when I when I started training at Steve's gym for the Teenage Mr. USA, I weighed about 220 pounds. And when I stepped on stage, I was 190 pounds. Jeez. So that was over the course of a few months. So it was really it was the dieting and the extreme training. Yeah. Now, was uh, Gruskin helping you through that of uh, that year? Because that was probably your best year, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, he I mean, I, and I, we were in touch. Okay. But, um, you know, he was, he was always, he always wanted to see me reach whatever potential I could reach and do the best that I could. But I, I know that he, he really wanted to see Jeff King yeah. uh, or Danny Morrow um, do the same, do, you know, reach their potential. Okay. So I, I would, I would say that, you know, they were his, his top, um, top bodybuilders for the teenage that year. Okay. Um, and then there were some others that were probably the close seconds. And I, I think that maybe I was one of the close seconds. Yeah. what do you think about Danny Morrow's physique? I'm actually going to, I think I'm supposed to interview him next week. So. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'll tell yeah. You Danny had pretty amazing symmetry. I remember that. Um, very, very good stage presence. Okay. Um, he, I don't know what happened to him after, after the teenage competitions. I, 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 I think I recall he competed in one of the uh, organizations like WABA or some, something like that. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, he, he really probably as, as in terms of potential probably had hmm, maybe even the most potential of any of the teenage bodybuilders. At that wow. Day. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. I heard uh, Chris Aceto talking about him before and he said he was really, really good. And Jeff King too. When I interviewed Jeff, Jeff said he was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember a guy in your class named uh, Joe Schroeder? He was from Chicago where I grew up. I was wondering if you remember. He took fifth. I don't remember the name. Okay. Yeah, Joe was one of those guys. He was very thick for a teenage bodybuilder. And mm -hmm. um, he trained with Glenn Kinnear. I remember you probably heard of Glenn Kinnear's name. Glenn went on to work oh, yeah. with Mr. America. So he was sure. like Glenn's best friend. But he was very thick and uh, – really great genetics, you know, but he just could never come in ripped enough. I don't think he was really as, uh, he, his desire wasn't as great as some other guys, you know what I mean? So I think sure. maybe because it came so easy to him to build that physique, he, he really would push it as hard, but yeah. Yeah. You know, there were, you know, there were, I probably took fifth. I was wondering if you remember him. It, it's, it's, the name sounds vaguely familiar, but I couldn't put the face to the name. Yeah. Um, you know, when you, when you talk about guys with potential that, that maybe didn't take it as seriously as they could, I remember back at Steve Mahalik's gym, there was a, a, a kid there by the name of Andy Lopey Dope. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, yeah I remember him. Yeah, he picked second Lopey Haney at the Teenage America. Yeah, yeah. And Andy was, uh, you know, he, would, he, would, he was kind of hit or miss coming to the gym. You'd see him, you know, he'd be having a hot dog at lunch. He, was, uh, <laughs> he just didn't take it as, as well as serious as we, we thought. You know, right. he had, he had tons of potential, but I guess he just, it just wasn't his thing. Yeah. Whatever happened to him, he just sort of faded away, right? I don't, I don't know. I yeah. don't know. And there was a, there was another teenage bodybuilder from, um, that I competed against also, uh, in the seventies, Frank Pantoja. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. Yeah, he was a Rory Liedemeyer protege, right? I believe so. Yeah. That guy had a great physique. And I yeah. mean, he was somebody that I just, I really expected to see you know, announced as Mr. America someday. 
Right, right. And there were others. I'm, you know, I mean, the guys that, that, you know, I came across in the competitions, you know, over the years, they, some of them went on to become Mr. America, Mr. Universe winners. Mm -hmm. uh, or some maybe, you know, not quite that distinguished, but at the same time, they, they made their, their mark on the scene. But yeah. there were, you know, I mean, I competed against, you know, uh, Doug Brignol, mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned John Defendus. Yeah. Um, gosh, there were, um, there were a host of others. And, and really, it was very competitive. Uh, just, you know, whoever peaked for that particular competition and yeah. what the judges were looking for, you know, would make the difference. Yeah. Uh, that was the time back when we were kind of transitioning into really uh, the ripped physique was getting a lot of attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think Frank Zane kind of led the way to that when he won the Olympia in the late 70s. Then everybody had to be ripped, you know? Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Yeah. Those teenage yeah. shows in the early 80s were really something to see. I mean, there was just, it just seemed like there was a lot of teenagers in America that wanted to be bodybuilders. And it's crazy how that's changed to where it is today. You know, I, I was covering, uh, I was going to a lot of shows, local shows a couple of years ago, and you'd maybe get one or two teenagers. That was it, you know? Really? Yeah. It just completely died off. You know, it doesn't seem like, it, unless they're going in other divisions, you know, now they have all those different divisions. But I would say in general, the teenage competitors are just not there anymore, you know? No, that's that's too bad. Yeah. Well, you you uh, you competed as a teenager in the early '80s, right? Yeah, I, from uh, '79 to '82. So I was around during the early '80s too. And like, speaking of numbers, I remember we had a contest in Illinois called the Teenage Illinois, and they wouldn't hold it in height classes; they held it in age groups. So you know, mm -hmm. when you're competing as a teenager and you're only 17, you got to go up against 19-year-olds. It's really tough. Yeah. So what they would do is they put the 19-year-olds in their own class. And then the 17, 18 year olds were in another class. And then 14 to 16 was in their own class. So you kind of had a better chance because you were competing against guys your own age. Yeah. Well, it was a great idea because they would have anywhere from 80 to 100 teenagers in that show. There was like 40, 40 kids in the uh, eight, 17 and 18 year old class alone. It was amazing. You know, and I tell people that today and they're like, and teenage? You know, I said, because they would, they would hold the teenage on its own that night. They wouldn't even hold it with the open events. Because yeah. there were so many kids in it, you know, so many teenagers. Right. It was, it's, uh, it, was a, it was a different game then, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So tell me about that Teenage USA. Tell me a little bit more uh, what you remember about that. Because, you know, you went in in really great shape. And uh, did you feel like you were going to win? I mean, how, how did the whole day go as you were competing? So I was, I was, I was fairly confident um, going into that show because I, I knew that um, Danny Morrow and I were – were very close in the teenage Mr. Pennsylvania competition. Okay. Um, and I had, my body had changed quite a bit over the course of six months till the teenage USA arrived. I was a lot leaner, a lot, a lot harder. Yeah. Um, again, I didn't know what to expect from, from Jeff King or some of the others, but I, I felt like I could hold my own with Danny depending on what kind of condition he arrived in. Yeah. Um, but there were, I didn't know, I didn't know, even, you know, I was on pins and needles, even going into the evening show when the, the winner mm -hmm. was announced. Jean-Paul Jean Guillaume was a very tough competitor. Yeah. And he also had potential written all over him. Yeah. Um, but so I didn't know if he was going to win. I didn't know if I would. I didn't know if Jeff King would win. Yeah. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know 100% that I was going to beat Danny Morrow for, within our class. Right. So it was just, it was a, it was a tremendous, tremendous feeling. Um, but, you know, I, I've got to say, uh, I, you know, I did, well, I did go on uh, uh, two years later and won the NPC Collegiate Nationals. Okay. And um, that was the, the first year that the NPC held the Collegiate Nationals show. Um, okay. I, I, I really can't find any records of it. Uh, mm. I don't know if it was actually a sanctioned show or, or what it was. But that year, Jeff King won the AAU Collegiate Mr. American. I won the NPC Collegiate Nationals. Oh, wow. And, um, it wasn't long after that that I started to become a little disillusioned with the sport because of the increased emphasis on drug use. I was seeing, um, I was seeing more politics in the sport than I than I cared for. Yeah, and I was also reaching a point in my life where I felt like I needed to make some some hard decisions because I didn't want to follow that. Um, I, I didn't want to continue with with drugs at, at an increased level. Yeah. Um, I didn't like the idea of spending what I thought at the time was necessary, you know, six days a week in the gym. Of course, I feel yeah. differently about that now. But um, there's there's a saying that uh, true happiness is found in the pursuit of happiness. 
Mm -hmm. And for me, that kind of applied because during the, the magical years of the 70s and, and early 80s when I was training, the thought of winning the national title just felt like it would be the, the, end, the, the end all and be all for, for everything. Yeah. And when I won, I was elated. I was, I was proud. I was happy. But there was a little bit of an emptiness to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's why I say it was, it was, you know, the pursuit of that happiness mm-hmm. was really yeah. the, the best part of it. And yeah. plus it was, you know, it was during that time when, um, you know, as a teenager, you can be very impressionable and you, you think that um, the sport is, is perfect and everything is perfect about it mm-hmm. and uh, a little naive. Yeah. Um, with, with the drugs, was it the health issues were you worried about, John, or were you, were you thinking the way your body looks or that you would have to keep taking them? What was, what was the uh, reason? I would say it was uh, all of the above. It was, you know, I was concerned about the, 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 the health effects of, of taking steroids. Yeah. Um, I would see after competition, I would see some water retention and I thought this, this just can't be healthy. Um, yeah. and, and from a moral perspective too, morality, I, I just, I felt like this is, this just isn't uh, right. It still felt like cheating to me, even though um, basically everybody at the national level was, was doing it. Yeah. Um, you know, I came from a, a long, long history of wrestling and um, that just seemed like a, a truer sport to me. I was still trying yeah. to figure out, is bodybuilding really a sport? And is this, is, is, I just didn't feel that comfortable about continuing down the same path that I was on. I did compete though. However, I came back in 1985 and I competed in the, um, I believe it was the WABBA WABA wow, Mr. Yeah. World. And that was, that was a show I never should have gone into. I, um, I kind of entered it half-heartedly, okay. um, just thinking, I just want to see if I, I still have the passion for this sport or not. And I went in, I think I took seventh or maybe eighth place in my class. It was, I wasn't nearly ready for the competition, but it was, you know, it was kind of a one last finale to see whether or not I wanted to yeah. give this up. Was that the one in Massachusetts? It was. Okay. I, I entered the amateur, Mr. World. Okay. Richard Roy run that, right? Yes. Yeah. Look, he looked phenomenal. Yeah. Okay. What did your family think about you doing bodybuilding, especially like when you won the Teenage USA? Uh, they were they were extremely supportive of it. Um, you know, and initially there was reservation because I was, you know, we were we were a wrestling family and very um, very into the sport. Yeah. And the more I got into bodybuilding, the more it seemed like I wasn't giving them one hundred percent for wrestling. Okay. Um, so there was a little bit of. Uh, lackluster support I'd say initially but yeah. then they they just became my biggest fans mm-hmm. they were, yeah it was it was great yeah did you um did you said you went to college did you do that with wrestling John or was that just uh, did you just go to college on your own I went to college on my own I um I contemplated wrestling um in, in school but uh the more and more I thought about it, I thought you know something I really want to I, I want to try to win the Teenage Mr. USA competition. And I felt yeah. like if I continued as wrestling, then that would be a lost dream. Right. Okay. Yeah. So when you look back now at that Teenage USA, does, does it still bring back great memories? You know, like, Oh yeah. Right later? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that was a, that was a time in my life that, you know, you just, you can't, you can't replace that. Right. Right. Um, and, and I would say that, you know, win or lose, those are just great times. Yeah. 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 I talked to a lot of bodybuilders and they say the same thing and they just, they'll always have those memories and it's really special, especially when you win a big show like you did, you know, a national level title, you know? Yeah. I was, I was fortunate to have that. Uh, my timing was just right for that, for that competition. Yeah. 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 You ever seen- it's, it's, a, it's a great sport. You know, it was, it was something that I pursued originally for, for health and to, to, to enhance my wrestling. Mm-hmm. And I seemed to add muscle pretty easily. And, you know, being with John after training with him after about a year, he said, you know, why don't you think about a competition? And that's when I did the Teenage Mr. Potomac Valley. And, um, okay. and from that point on, I just, it was, it was a love affair with the, the iron. Yeah. So after you won that collegiate, you didn't think about going on to the Mr. America like Jeff did, did you? I tell you, um, I, I was training for the Junior Nationals. Okay. The NPC Junior Nationals that, that next year. And I was about two weeks out from the competition and I was in what I, I considered to be the best shape of my life. 
Hmm. It's kind of uh, like the appearance of the teenage Mr. USA, but about 20 pounds heavier. Wow. And I received a call and they said, um, you know, John, you're not qualified for this competition. Oh. And they said, you know, you can go into a show, a, a regional qualifier this coming weekend. And, and I just, I was so off put by that. Here I had one teenage Mr. USA and the NPC collegiate nationals, but I could go in the, you know, Mr. Anthracite competition and qualify. Right, <laughs> I just right. felt like, you know, something, maybe this is, this is something that is, it's, um, the writing is on the wall for me. Maybe this is a good time for me to step away. So that was that between then and 1985, when I competed in that Mr. World, there was no, no bodybuilding training, you know, to, to oh, speak right. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think Rich Gaspari won that yeah, year. Yeah, I was going to say that. Gaspari won that year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was, you know, the, I guess the rules were the rules, but at, the, at that time I was young, naive, and kind of stubborn, and I, I just felt like well, maybe they have somebody in mind that they want to see win. Yeah. Because of the letting me know. It was, maybe it was even 10 days before the competition, but I just felt like, you know, something maybe, maybe uh, it stacked against me, and so I'm, I'm just not going to pursue it. Mm. And in, in retrospect, that was, I was probably, probably wrong about that. The, you know, the rules were the rules, but at the right. time it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah. I remember back then when that's, when the NPC started, they were really strict about who was qualified and who wasn't because you had yeah. a lot of guys coming over from the AAU. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. That would have been interesting though, to see uh, where you would have been like 210 pounds, right? 210 pounds shredded with more muscle in the same condition as a teenage USA. Yeah, I guess Rich Gaspari, that would have been interesting. Yeah, and you know, I mean, uh, Rich Gaspari, you know, was a phenomenal bodybuilder, but you know, yeah. he hadn't uh, he hadn't reached uh, the zenith of his career. No, he was like eighty three. So I, I, I think it would have been an interesting yeah. competition. Yeah, David Hawk was in that show too. I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. I remember David Hawk and Rich Gaspari being competitors in that show. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, John. Well, uh, thanks for telling us uh, your story about the, uh, the bodybuilding in the early days and uh, your, your teenage Mr. USA win. Um, that was great stuff. So you're basically just working now. Uh, you retired, but you're still working and uh, you're planning on looking at retirement and are you and your wife uh, traveling and stuff in a couple of years. Huh? Yeah, it's exactly. We, um, one, of, one of the, the hobbies that, that I have is, is uh, woodworking and timber frame building. And uh, my wife and I built a timber frame cabin over in, in West Virginia. We we love to hike and we have, we love going out with our dogs. We have rescue dogs. Yeah. And um, uh, so we, 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 we built a timber frame cabin oh, and cool. um, we, we do spend a lot of weekends out there. And now with, with COVID we have high speed internet service out there so that, um, you know, we'll, we'll work from out there as, as well. Okay. And that pretty much takes up a lot of our, our time is, uh, between here and the, you know, we, I live in Northern Virginia, but between here and, okay. and going out to the cabin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, John. Well, it was great meeting you. And uh, thanks again for your story and, and telling us all about those, uh, those early days of bodybuilding. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll tell Danny Morrow you said hi when I talk to him next week. <laughs> please, please do. Um, and it's, it was a pleasure, pleasure meeting you, John. And thank you for having me on the show. All right. You're welcome. Thanks, John. Take care.